choir. That was beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. This is a sweet, beautiful Sunday morning, is it not? Amen. The air is crisp. The sun is shining. And we need to praise the Lord for it. Today is our 18th Sunday in Pentecost, after Pentecost, or our 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So, please turn off all unnecessary electronics, and if you will, take your bulletin. Today is um, Well Root. We need to have the everything for Well Root in by the 29th, and they'll be t it'll be taken care of. Please remember that. And uh, Pastor Sandy will be conducting a new member's informational class October the 10th before the worship service, and the date is in there. So if anyone's interested and need more information, please contact uh, Pastor Sandy or the church office. So, And we're helping Homa, Louisiana. So we're helping uh, Oakwood. Uh, do this and the list is in the bulletin please remember to to take care of that if you're uh, pray about it those people really need help if you've never lost your home to flood or fire I've lost two homes and it is devastating so please remember that these people they have nothing absolutely nothing so please remember them in your prayers and uh, participate. Now, the COVID uh, updates are always is also in the bulletin, so please be aware. And our offering plates are in the windows and at the uh, as you go out the door. Uh, excuse me. In the lectionary reading today, from Psalm 124, verse eight. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let's praise the Lord. Please now let's focus on worship. Let us pray. Here in this sanctuary, we remember, O oh God, your gift of life to each of us. We remember, O oh God, your invitation to belong, your reign of justice and righteousness. Here in this sanctuary, we remember, O oh God, your sacrifice of love and mercy. We remember all that you have done for us. Here in this sanctuary today, we remember also your call to live what we sing and pray. And so we commit ourselves again to carry our worship from this sanctuary to here, there, and everywhere we may go. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you will, please stand for our opening hymn, Standing on the Promises.
You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to see all of you on this beautiful fall day. We can say that now, right? Is it officially fall? Um, We're glad that you're here with us this morning as we worship God. So right now here at this moment, we is our time to lift up our attributes and our praises. So we start by lifting up those attributes or characteristics of God that we've seen in the past week and then go into a time of praises. And then after that, as we um, as we pray, we'll have an opportunity to lift up those who are on our hearts this morning. So with that, what kind of attributes of God did you see this week? God was healer, healer, provider. Provider, Protect. protector, creator, creator. Guiding, the way. guiding the way. Great. And what kind of appraises do we want to to uplift today? Cool air. Cool air. <laughs> Answered prayers. Answered prayers. Good. Less spiders. I think there's less. I'm seeing less spiders. <laughs> Great. That is a praise when <laughs> when our lost <laughs> items, especially those our wallet, comes yes, back to yes, us. Yes. Uh, amen for that. Uh, we had um, we celebrated our um, our future daughter-in-law's uh, bridal shower yesterday. So my sister and her husband came into town, and and then as I shared with you about a month ago about um, Dolores Richardson's and my connection to to our church up in Chicago. They had their, their little reunion this morning, too, so that was a blessing. Randy? I wanted to share with everybody, uh, Melissa Richardson has been on our prayer list for a long time. She had her uh, kidney removal surgery last Wednesday. Turns out she didn't have to, have to have all of it removed. They only had to take part of it. They took the tumor out, but they were able to save enough of the kidney so that it can function. And uh, they found out that the tumor was benign. Okay. She's still in the hospital trying to kind of get her body back in order and also to uh, fight some pain, but she would rather do it at the hospital than do the weekend clinics, but hopefully she'll be able to come home in the next few days. Yeah, we'll continue to pray for her, her continued healing as well. So that is a praise. Any others? And my, my son's father-in-law, so I don't know exactly how, because they moved up here from Orlando from their hometown they'd always lived in, and so he actually starts what... He hopes is his dream job on Tuesday. Good, so he's good. got, you know, the one he was ho- hoping he would get. Good. So, so provider. Yes, God's provision for that. Amen. Any others as I lose my balance and fall over? <laughs> no communion wine this morning, I promise. <laughs> April. Six weeks on the job and no big complaints. Good. Still loving it. Good. Good. Any others? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this this beautiful autumn morning that you've given us and this time to come together as the body of Christ. We thank you for all that you are in our individual lives and the celebrations that we are able to lift up as we see the blessings that you bestow upon us. And Lord, as we come together, there are also individuals who are heavy on our hearts, those who need healing and those who are are battling um, illnesses, those who have lost the loved ones and, and are dealing with grief and those who are just lost and need direction. So Lord, at this time, we lift up the following to you. We lift up Kitty Green. Frank and Elizabeth Nix. Yeah. Blair Jones and David Runyon. Betty Fish and John Money. Deanna Etheridge. Aaron Martin. Earl Wolf. Gwen Allen. The family of Steve Hughes and the family of David Harper. Alan and Mary Alice are traveling. Lord, hear our prayers. We give you thanks that you are already aware and in 
each and every one of these circumstances. Lord, we ask that you would allow us to be your hands and feet, feet to these individuals as we walk alongside of them through their journey, as we pray for them, as we, we call or send an encouraging word, that they realize that in addition to your Holy Spirit being with them, that we represent you and your love as well. And Lord, at this time, we ask that Holy Spirit to fill this place, that your word would penetrate our hearts and that our worship would be pleasing unto you. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we again thank you for this time and we ask that we allow ourselves just to put aside the, anything that we're carrying with us from the week past or any anxiousness about the week to come and to allow ourselves just to be present in your presence. And it's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. amen. There is a lot going on in our, our Mark passage this morning. There's exorcism and accusations there's talk about maiming and hell and there's this odd piece about salt so let's jump right in and read about these peculiar things by turning to mark 9 uh, verses 38 through 50 it's also in your bulletin so mark 9 starting in verse 38 John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. 
whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If, you, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If it is better for you to enter, it is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquestionable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is a better. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So all these things that we read about kind of seem disjointed at first, but as we look closer this morning, we will see that it all relates to the topic of comparison and the applications that arise or the complications that are, arise when we focus on comparing ourselves to others. So first, let us look at the disciples and especially John we find him kind of tattletelling on someone who is casting out demons in Jesus' name, but isn't part of their group that's been following Jesus around. And what's interesting that is that earlier in chapter 9, a man comes to Jesus with his son who has an unclean spirit, only after first going to the disciples who failed to cast out the spirit. So then the question becomes, are the disciples upset because somebody outside their circle is tapping into Jesus' power? Or could it be that they're jealous that this unknown person was more successful in casting out demons where they had previously failed? We, like the disciples, can get caught up in comparing ourselves to others. And we, as a church, can get caught up in comparing ourselves to other churches and other denominations. We can start comparing ourselves to their size. You know, do, do they have more members than us? Are they growing? Or we can compare ourselves to the impact that they're having in the community. But then we have to ask ourselves, why? Why does it matter? And Jesus tells his disciples, he says, do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon after to speak evil of me. So basically Jesus is saying, if this guy wasn't a believer, soon he will be because of the results that he's seeing because of my name. It's almost like telling someone that they shouldn't pray because they don't go to church. When actually by continuing to pray, that person might just be led to to a desire of connecting with the body of Christ to enhance their time of worship. But getting back to our, our comparison of other churches, plain and simple, we shouldn't compare ourselves with other churches as difficult as that might be at times. For such comparison takes our focus off of our mission of serving God, and it puts it onto figuring out who's doing ministry better, them or us. We also shouldn't waste our energies on doing the same ministries as other churches. Where we have, this, where we have similar ministries and interests, we should be combining our efforts for a greater impact. And then where our ministries differ, we should celebrate and support each other's endeavors. For example, we do a great job with working ecumenically in the community through ministries like the food pantry and the back to school event and trunk or treat and the few times that we've come together for Easter sunrise service. But there are other ministries that are solely certain churches undertakings, such as Flowery Branch Thanksgiving boxes. 
Now here, we have Thanksgiving baskets. And so they kind of sound similar ministry-wise. So we decided one year to go combine efforts for, to see if we could make a greater impact in, instead of us both trying to do the same thing. But we soon realized that we served different demographics. They, we served the, mainly the families at, El, at the Oakwood Elementary, and they served a whole different kind of demographics. And we realized that we would be making more of an impact separately and, and decided to do that, even though we respected and had similar ministries. Also with McEver Road UMC's new property, they plan on a ministry of community space with walking trails and a community pavilion in addition to their new church facilities. So that is a wonderful use of their property and we celebrate, rather than trying to compare ourselves to them, we celebrate their out of the box approach to ministry and, and you know, hope that all of that, it'll be a blessing for the community. Now Miles Brown did a great job last week here with preaching at our homecoming service, but when Miles was serving at First Baptist of Oakwood, I saw online where when it was time for a sermon one Sunday, he rode in on a unicycle. And my first thought was, wow. And then I, the second thought was like, I don't even have to compare myself to that because it is in the best well-being that my physical well-being that I do not try to compete with that although it makes me wonder why he didn't enter in last Sunday knowing that he has that skill that he didn't enter in to do the the service last Sunday in that way we'll have to ask him they're in the mountains this weekend enjoying enjoying the weather but the reason we've ended up with so many different denominations and even different churches within denominations in a certain geographical area is because people have different ways of worshiping. We have different ways of interpret interpreting the scripture and we have different ways of approaching ministry. In Corinthians, in the first Corinthians, we read where people were debating who was the greater teacher of the gospel. Was it Paul or Apollos? And when Paul recognized that this was happening, that this comparison was happening, he was quick to point out that there was no need for it, that they were both doing the work of God, and that their individual approach was not a competition with one another, but a cooperation, each enhancing each other's efforts. In fact, he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 7, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Another example is in Acts where Paul and Barnabas are serving together, taking the good news of Christ out into the world. But then they come to a place where they saw a, sit a particular situation differently and, and could not agree on it, and they decided to split up and do ministry on their own. And on the surface, it seems unfortunate, but it resulted in more regions being exposed to the teachings of Christ as the two of them continued to carry on in different directions. So rather than comparing ourselves to other churches and denominations, we should celebrate the fact that there are numerous ways that people are exposed to the name of Jesus. We join forces where we can, and then we celebrate and support those areas in which we reach people differently. The work of the kingdom is not a competition, but instead a cooperation. Next in our passage, Jesus talks about stumbling blocks, saying that it is better to lose a hand or a foot or an eye than to cause a little one to stumble or sin. And I take that phrase, little one, to mean a new believer or even a not yet believer. And I want to approach this, this idea of stumbling blocks in more from the perspective of one growing in their faith rather than a, a sin perspective. So we, we as Christians, even though well-intended most of the time, we place so many stumbling blocks 
in the path of new Christians and those who do not even have a relationship with Christ yet. And this has really been highlighted to me through our perspectives on missions class that we had a few years ago. Several of the missionaries came and to speak to us and shared with us the damage that well-intentioned Western people do on short-term mission trips. We, we come to another culture, we come into another culture, and we try to convert them to our Western ways of worship and our Western ways of understanding who Christ is based on our culture, rather than helping them to recognize that he is already there in their presence, in their culture, and they just don't realize it, or they have been calling him by another name, again, based on their culture. Mary Alice and I took another class called Jesus and the Quran, and they talked about the same thing with the, with the Muslim culture, that we tend to fail when we try to make them approach things from a Western point of view. But a successful missionary who is educated on the culture can point out that the deity and that power that can only come from Jesus can be found in their own Quran scriptures. It just needs to be pointed out by people who are educated and able to do that. And we see these same kinds of stumbling blocks in the New Testament as well, where the Council of Apostles are debating whether or not the Gentiles needed to be circumcised in order to be recognized as saved as a believer of Jesus. For that was a Jewish requirement. So the question came down to, do we need to convert them to Judaism in order to convert them to Christianity? And the decision that they came to was, was no, with the realization that the circumcision was not what saved the person. It was God's grace that saved a person. And they just asked them not to um, eat the food that was sacrificed for the idols because that was the problem at the moment, that they were used to having multiple gods with small g's and they wanted to help them to worship the one and only God with a big g. Another way in which Paul introduced the one true God to a different culture was when he was in Athens. He walked through the city and saw all the statues of their, of their gods, again with the little g's, and, and saw a nameplate that said, Un, an unknown God. And he basically said, see, you know that there is something else out there. There is something more out there. So let me tell you who this God is. Now, Paul didn't go in there and knocking down all their their statues and yelling, you've got it all wrong. He just observed a void, an opening, and introduced them to the one that they had been searching for. Like the Council of the Apostles, we tend to put too many rules or too many stumbling blocks on people of new faith and people who are searching. And we put so many on them that they just get frustrated. We say things like, you have to give up all of your bad habits first before you can ask Jesus into your heart. Or you are welcome into our church, but you can't sit there because that's my seat. Or thank you for, for volunteering, but that committee or that ministry or that project is so-and-so's baby, and they wouldn't want anyone suggesting changes, even if it does make it more efficient. When we throw up roadblocks, or stumbling blocks in the path of a person's spiritual growth. They will get frustrated. They'll throw up their hands and leave the church, or worse yet, never start to begin with. Last week I had to do some demographic research for our charge conference reports. And in doing so, I came across this information and I thought it was really eye-opening. Within 2.5 mile radius of our church, of, and of those who are not connected to a church in that 2.5 mile radius, these are the top reasons why they're not connected to a church. 
The first one, religion is too focused on money. Second, religious people are judgmental. And third one, don't, they don't trust organized religion. And four is they don't trust religious leaders. And it wasn't even until number six where it was stated that the reason they're not connected to a church is because they don't believe in God. And even that, even the, the they don't believe in God was categorized under somewhat strong. Those other four were categorized under very strong reasons for not being connected to a church. So the, the fact that it, they probably did believe in God, but it was those four things that a, a thinking church people are, are judgmental or focused on money or not trusting the church or the leaders are the main reason for not being connected to a church. All above not believing in God. We can't fall under the curse of comparison by putting stumbling blocks, such as demands and expectations that someone needs to look and act a certain way in order to be Christian. For Jesus gives us a very strong warning about cutting off body parts and worms in hell for those who do. Instead, we are to be more like Jesus, accepting people where they are in life, not passing judgment and leading by example. Church is not a fraternity or a sorority or a country club. There shouldn't be hazing or, or an initiation process. All are welcome as they are. Jesus is about transformation, not conformity. Our passage closes with the odd topic about salt. Jesus says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So this topic brings the focus back upon ourselves. We are to stop comparing ourselves to others. We are to stop, we are to stop trying to make others conform. And instead, we are to focus on keeping ourselves fresh and productive and useful in order to be an influence on others positively and in order to season others' lives. However, we are of no use if we become stale. And we present, prevent ourselves from becoming stale by focusing on Jesus, rather than focusing on what other people are doing. And when we do that, when we focus solely on Jesus, others will take notice and want some of that seasoning, seasoning for themselves, that, that spice in, in their life, if you will. Salt was also considered a holy commodity. It was used as an offering to God in the temple. It was used to seal covenants between people. And it was a symbol of trust and peace. May we never lose our ability to offer trust and peace to those that we minister to. May we never lose our saltiness. The goal of faith is not winning, unlike the goal of our culture. Our culture seems to tell us that it is, but that is not the goal of faith. The goal of believing is not who can do it better. Faith is not about comparison. Faith is an individual expression that in co cooperation with the faith of others, can accomplish the work of God's kingdom that leads to the transformation of the world. Let us pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. And when at first glance it seems odd and, and disjointed, but as we dig deeper, we see it's all about comparison and competition. And that is not your will for us at all. Your will for us is as the body of Christ to come together, recognizing that each and every one of us has different gifts and talents, and that you specifically made us that way so that when we do come together, we are complete and can accomplish so much more. And Lord, it breaks my heart to see those, the research of how church and Christians are viewed within our neighbors right around our church. <coughs> Help us to be more loving. Help us to present ourselves as, as more giving than taking and as more loving than judgmental and allowing us to, to exhibit the saltiness that Jesus talks about so that we can instill and project trust and peace. Lord, we thank you that you trust us with this ministry here on earth. And Lord, help us to be faithful in executing it. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Bless you. Y'all, please stand uh, as we sing our last hymn. And it's into my heart and it's up on the screen. As you go forth this week, be, be aware of how, how people might perceive you, especially young, young Christians or those who are not of the faith yet. And are you, are you projecting um, a level of expectation upon them, or are you just accepting them and allowing Jesus to do the transformation? So make sure your saltiness does not become stale by keeping your focus on Jesus. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>